Our next speaker is Susan Jelin from Harvard University and she's going to tell us about super radiance in arrays, new insights and applications. Um, good morning to everybody and um, my apologies, I'm totally flustered because the technology doesn't work. Um, it's this, there, there are interesting problems that you have. My problem is actually purely mechanical. <laughs> Namely, the two, the two plugs don't fit next to each other into the computer. So be careful when you buy a computer. All right, so I will just stand here and, and, and advance this all manually. So yeah. Um, so it's fine. Should I should I switch it off? Um, do we need it for for Zoom? Yeah, we need it not for Zoom for the YouTube. Okay. So I will take this a little bit further down and not speak that loud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Okay, let's go ahead. So um, super radiance was found I mean, 70 years ago um, by by Dicke, and then 30 years later. Um, um, Gross and Tarosh wrote a review that basically everybody learns from. Um, there have been some advances, both in super radiance and in general, um, in general um, applications. And so these days we just ask ChatGPT, and I'm not going to read that for you, but it's actually a pretty good answer. Okay, so um, let me just very briefly, I know everybody has talked about that, but I would like to give this very brief inter, um, introduction into super radiance. So if we have a single atom um, that decays, we get an um, a exponential fall off of the intensity over time. If we do that with two atoms that are far apart, we get the same thing. But if we put the two atoms close together, we see a little bit of a change in this, in this um, time signature. This is, by the way, the intensity per atom. And then, of course, we can do um, a lot, <laughs> um, like, for example, 10 here. And what we see here, and what I actually do need, is a laser pointer. Um, so what we do see is this initial um, um, flash of, of light that comes out in the super radiance. So this is somehow the kind of um, smoking gun for super radiance. Um, what kind of um, one knows about that is that this is an, an effect that goes with n squared and it's due to constructive interference because we are actually adding up all of this kind of light amplitudes here. And there is this so-called build-up of collective dipoles, which is actually a little bit of a misnomer, but I will not go into this, other than this one here. So the, the basic um, um, background between, for, for, for all of these cooperative effect are dipole-dipole interactions, and these dipole-dipole interactions are really, and, and Timan Fau was telling that yesterday already, we do not have any dipole moment for any of the states, but we have this exchange interaction of, of excitation of two atoms. So we have one atom in a ground state, one atom in an excited state, and we have this exchange where, where they exchange the excitation. And this leads to the dipole-dipole interaction. That's basically what the whole talk is about. Um, so um, let's introduce thicker states. Thicker states are the fully symmetric um, state of n excitations in large n particle. Here I have the second excitation for four particle state and as you can see this is the fully symmetric states and these are the sta kind of states that decay with this this n squared speed up um, and the best way to describe that if you want to really fully describe it to every detail is to go into an angular momentum form and then this looks like that and the leftmost column is the um, n half angular momentum state and these decays are the, the, the Dicke decays are these yellow arrows. And if you want to do Dicke um, super radiance, this is all you need and you can throw all the rest out and in principle I could go home. Um, however, if you um, add dipole-dipole interaction, that dipole-dipole interaction is typically much, much smaller than the, than the energy difference between the states. And that connects all of the other lower symmetry kind of manifolds um, to, the, to the system as well. 
And um, the whole problem becomes a two to the n dimensional problem, and that is usually very hard to solve. Um, what one sees very nicely in this picture is also that there are a lot of lowest state in each of those manifolds, which kind of cannot decay fast anymore because they are at the bottom of their manifold and can basically, if you are here or here or here, you can get out of that only um, via dipole-dipole interaction and so this is a slow evolution and this is what we know as subradiant states. And um, in principle, this is, this is all the physics, right? I mean, if you fully understand that, we are done here. Let me ne nevertheless tell you somehow a little bit more. So I show you some ways how to calculate this. Um, I will kind of go into the question of the collective land shift, um, tell a little bit about subradiance, even though this kind of got crowded out, a little bit about entanglement and applications. And in particular, the calculation is, of course, if we have realistic dipole-dipole interaction. And um, in particular, about the collective lamp shift, the main question is first how to even define it. And then, of course, how to calculate it. So I will start, however, um, so I, I gave the title of this talk as, as um, 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 as, as super radiance in a race. I will not do everything in a race, but I will start in a race. So we, we are kind of thinking about kind of 2D order the race of that type. And I have put a couple of references here because they, they should all show up and I just um, um, decided I list them all here. So this is kind of uh, the, the, latest, the latest ones that, that we have here. That's all. Um, so. Um, Dicky superradiance is a phenomenon with the atoms that um, are in a totally, they start totally avert, inverted and they are in a point-like sample and they synchronize and emit light coherently as you have seen before. Um, and recently people have looked a lot at um, what happens if the ensemble is actually not point-like. So like, like for example our two level, uh, uh, two, sorry, 2D array. And there's, of course, a lot of this done, and a lot of the people who have done it are here. Um, and I'm not going into, into any of these details, and this is also by no means a comprehensive list. I just give you a little bit of an idea of how we approach this. So we start with this, with this system. Um, um, and, and here, I, um, in particular, what is important is these are two level systems and um, we have a lattice constant or in general a distance between atoms that's smaller than the, than the transition wavelengths. And um, we have here really the typical way of calculating this. We have a Hamiltonian which includes this coherent interactions via dipole-dipole <laughs> and a, a Lindblad operator which includes both the collective and the individual um, dissipation. And this interaction strength, both the, the, the coherent part and the incoherent part, are the real and imaginary parts of the dipole-dipole Green's function. This is basically what is here in the picture. And what we, what we solve is the, is the total um, master equation. And this, of course, is a complicated long-range interaction dissipative many-body system. And all of you know that, that you always need to use some tricks to solve this. So first trick. Um, we use cumulants. And this is actually, um, there is a nice package which was developed in Innsbruck, um, um, which, which you can download. Um, which does this automatically for you. It's actually very nice. Um, so how does this cumulant expansion work? Here's basically this, this system again that we have before. And what we are doing is we are calculating expectation values, both first the mean field and higher order correlations, and um, take the cumulants, which are basically the essence of correlations. And this program that I gave you before basically does this for you. So the equations, they could look really pretty and you don't want to do this by hand. And this is, I think, up to, um, up to third order here, what you see on the right side. So it gets better if you go to a higher order. OK, so um, let me answer just one single question using this. There's a lot of questions that you can answer. And many people have done that from several aspects. So the question is, um, 
given letter spacing, given atom number, given geometry, when do you get superradiance? So, um, one way to look at this is to look at the, at the time evolution. So I'm sorry, this is actually time, logarithmic time here in, in orders of the natural decay rate. Um, and the, the lines that you see here are, are time traces for, for different sets of parameters here. It doesn't matter what they are. So um, some of them have a slope that goes downward to start with, and some of them have a slope that goes upwards. And um, this is actually a pretty good possible definition for superradiance. It's not the definition, but pe many people use this. Um, and so what we actually need to look is the to, to look at the total correlate the, the complete decay rate at t equals zero, and if the slope of that is larger than zero, we call it superradiance, and otherwise we call it not superradiant. And that's of course with a nod to this kind of initial burst that I told you before. Um, so um, the second order correlation, a okay, cumulant formulation that I just showed you before, um, governs obviously dynamics, dynamics at early times, so that's a very useful, um, useful tool for that. So again, we, let's assume we have a fully inverted system, then um, we can, in, in this cumulant approximation, write the, the solution for this problem analytically. And it's actually pretty simple, and it depends only on the gamma part and not on the shift or j part of the, of the um, interaction. And of course, um, we are not the only ones who looked at superradiance. There's, for example, a, a paper by Stuart, um, um, who also looked at that, both in 1D and 2D. Um, but what our cumulant um, 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 calculation can do is it can also not just tell you how is, the, how is the slope here, but also how high does it go, which is obviously also a pretty good measure, right? And in particular, you see that it's very important. So this, this, this is um, only for four atoms here. <laughs> either in a line or in a square. And this white line that you see here is basically um, the limit of uh, that, that, that um, one would get from this pure kind of initial slope here. And you can see that this seems to, so here's the maximum of, of this, this maximum here. This is the color coding here. And what we have on the axis is the, is the lattice spacing and the number of atoms. And you see that the, the really kind of interesting stuff happens actually pretty far away from this limit. Um, in particular, um, if we look at how this, this, this strength of the superradiance scales with, with n, um, for 1D, that seems to follow pretty much the same kind of line shape that you just saw before. But if you go into the 2D lattice, and please do note this is here logarithmic, um, um, one actually sees that depending on the parameters, and here the parameter that we change the lattice constant, goes to the power law. And here we even can kind of plot this power law as a function of this A. And please do note that, that we go here in, in, into a couple of hundred atoms, which is still kind of relatively easy to calculate. Are they both on the scale? No, no, the first one is not. Because that one, that one does just not give anything interesting on the log, log scale. More and more atoms, it just reaches a plateau, essentially, right? Exactly. Why the other one? Some it goes with the power law, and as far as far up as we could go with the with the atom number, um, this power law persists. Um, so uh, the next question, which is very related, is how many atoms? So f so far, this was fully inverted. So next question: How many atoms do you actually need to have excited in your in your system in order to to get superradiance? So this is if you optimize all the other parameters, how many atoms do you need? And you can do that um, um, analytically as well. And you get this formula, which depends on the same parameters that we said, saw before. Please do note that what we are looking at is a system like that, where we say we either excite an atom or don't. We don't have any coherent oxidation or something like that. And this, ex this, this um, 
uh, expression that we have here is an average over all possible kind of um, configurations that we get here. And if we compare that to the, to the Dicke case where we have these excitation point likes, a point like that basically simplifies to the fact that we need um, to excite one more than half of the atoms in order to see super radiance, which should not come as a surprise. Okay, so that was the, the kind of somewhat straightforward way to calculate this. Now I would like to, and I will get back to that, but I would like to kind of now introduce um, a way how to calculate um, really big um, three-dimensional homogeneous um, collections of two-level atoms. So this is really basically the opposite end of, of a limit case. And here, um, this kind of atom by atom kind of master equation approach doesn't work anymore. So what we have to do here, we have to do some averaging much earlier. So here is how, how this works. So we have our ensemble of atoms. We write a Hamiltonian with all degrees of freedom. And then we select randomly two probe atoms and define all the others as surrounding atoms, such that our full dynamics is now a description of two atoms plus a field. And that gives us an effective two atom description. So how does that look like in, in mass speak? Um, we have obviously the atom and field Hamiltonian, and then we have the interaction Hamiltonian, um, which, which is the, the, in a typical dipole approximation. And then this selecting of two atoms and field means we define as the interaction Hamiltonian only the interaction of the two probe atoms with the field, but the field is now a dressed field, which is already dressed with the interaction of, with all of the other atoms. So it's really, um, it's the same, has the same amount of physics so far, there's no approximation. This is all still exact. It's of course undoable, but it's exact. Um, and then we can write that as an effective um, evolution operator, which we then can calculate with. Please do note one of the main kind of obvious differences that treats the dipole-dipole interaction exactly the same way as what you have seen before, but it's never really spelled out explicitly. It's all basically <coughs> hidden in here. It's basically if you take this expression, put it in a Green's function, and then integrate the Green's function out, but we don't integrate the Green's function out. So that's basically the idea. And so this two, two atom, this effective two atom description comes, now we have to make a couple of, of um, approximation. So we also again go into a cumulant expansion and keep the cumulant expansion to the second order. So this is the main approximation that we make here. And then we, then we um, uh, trace out all the field degrees of freedom because we are interested in the dynamics of the atoms and then we have a two atom master equation. And that one gives us a lot of, we cannot solve that completely analytically, that's very nonlinear. But it gives us a, an analytical dependence on all of the necessary parameters, and therefore is super useful. Okay, so what we, for example, get in that, from that is here, this is the excited state population, um, which um, here we actually haven't started with fully inverted, but nearly fully inverted. And this is again, please do note, this is again on a, on a um, um, logarithmic time scale. So we have this really fast decay, which is super radiance. At the end, we have radiation trapping, but this plateau in the middle here is actually subradiance. And that was something. In the meantime, everybody knows this, but when we first found that, we were a little bit surprised. So here, we go into a little bit more detail and do that for various opticals, um, optical depths. So here, you see the optical depths in the, in the color and the, the, the time trace for the, for the uh, vacuum decay um, is in, in black here. And what you see is everywhere the super radiant decay, this long plateau which gets longer as the optical depth goes up, and then this final decay which is actually radiation trapping. So radiation trapping is a completely incoherent um, process which consists just of, of reabsorption and re-emitting of photon in, which is completely incoherent. So you don't need quantum for that or anything like that. Subradiance, however, is a very quantum effect. So 
obviously there's something happening here somewhere in the middle in this subradian but in order to figure whether this is really subradians we have to prove that this is really coherent here and so what we are plotting is here the two atom coherence please do note that this the single atom coherence which we usually write as rho eg is zero everywhere for in this case but this is the two atom coherence and that actually does get um, non-zero exactly over this over this time frame when we see the subradiance. So it is subradiance, I think this is, this is pretty clear. Um, here I have shown the intensity per atom, that's the same as this, as this cross Roche picture that you saw before. But here also, um, 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 scaled by the optical depths, and you see that this is really, um, this whole superradiance is really completely universal. Right. So that's, that's, that's actually something, and um, it's not very beautifully universal if you're still at small optical depths, but starting with a certain optical depth somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000, it becomes um, universal. Okay, so this is what we can do. So let's look at one application of this, um, and what we are looking at is molecular laser cooling. So here is a, is the, are the two lowest um, um, electronic states of a, of a molecule. Um, and this, of course, has vibrational levels and it has rotational levels. And the question is, how can we laser cool this? We are not the first people who ask this question. Um, um, we are probably, um, we are definitely not the first people who came up with the, with the knowledge that we need for laser cooling a cyclical transition. Cyclic transition? Cyclic transition, sorry. The cyclic transition, however, nearly don't exist in molecules. There are special ones, and you can use some tricks, but a priori they don't exist. So what we are planning to do is to use just the lowest vibrational transition, because the second vibrational, first excited vibrational um, state, obviously, has nowhere to decay than the lowest one. Right? So it's certainly cyclic. But um, it's also super, super slow, so if you, if you just let it sit there, and, and you, you, can, you can laser cool for a long, long time, right? So, what do we do about this? Um, well, we use super radiance, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't talk about this here. So, how does that go? Um, so, um, from this, um, one could actually, from this treatment that I showed you before, read off that, this, that, the, that the decay rate, in particular in the very superradiant um, regime, pretty much goes up by the optical depths. This is kind of, this is a bold statement to make because the decay rate is not really a rate anymore as we know it because it's not an exponential decay, etc. But as a kind of a rough estimate, um, this one does actually pretty well. So what is the optical depth that we have? So optical depth is the number density times the, 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 um, the wavelength squared times the size times the population of the upper state. And here I have a couple, put a couple of numbers in what, which, which could be kind of feasible for molecules. And what we see is that we get about a 10 to the 5, um, um, a 5 order of magnitude increase. So that should in principle work. But we should of course prove that this really works. There is another problem, namely the momentum kip of these large lambda photons and the examples that I just gave was 100 micron, right? I mean, um, that doesn't give you a lot of momentum kick to cool. So what do we do about that? Well, we make a Raman transition. And <laughs> the Raman transition is to the, to the, to the excited state. And, um, and therefore, if we make the beams counterpropagating, we basically get two optical photon kind of momentum kicks per decay. Okay, so then it doesn't look so bad anymore. So how does this work? Um, um, well, not a problem. Um, we don't want any, because of the cyclic transition business, we don't want any excited state population because they typically dis de decay wherever and are gone. So what, in our case, the way we model this, we have a state four and whatever is the state four is in the black hole never comes out anymore. Um, so, solution is use EIT, okay? And EIT is well known for the fact that you, you drive between two lower states and the upper state never gets excited, okay? And it turns out that actually works pretty well in this case. Um, 
Um, and here is, a, is are some, some results of where we do this. Um, um, this is um, the, the velocity of the, of the molecules on the average um, in, in, in units of the recoil velocities. And for the example that we have here, and I, I forgot what, what mass we took, but um, what we get here is kind of on the, in the nano-Kelvin regime. So this is crazy. It works very well. Why does it work so well? In principle, because of course the Doppler limit for a vibrational transition is tiny, right? Um, this is of course not realistic. There will be some broadening this will, that which make that much, much bigger and we have not kind of fully taken that into account here. This is basically just a best case scenario. Um, one thing that I kind of also let dropped a little bit under the table is that, of course, a real level scheme cannot have a close three level transition. So we have to actually go to a six level transition, which means we have to look at two rotational states per level. And this is actually how our, our um, simulations have been done. And um, the final figure of merit is how many molecules do we actually keep? And this is the, the time, um, basically, for as you can see, for, for a couple um, of different of these time traces before, but in particular, the one where it's fastest. So the point is, we would be about here by the time we are at the minimum of the, um, of the, of the cooling. So we, we lose half of the, the half of the molecules, but in principle, this is this, I think, still kind of it. OK. Um, then I should actually say that was a that was a project that I did with an with an undergrad who is kind of not an undergrad anymore, um, but but um, um, Caleb um, did did basically all the simulations here. Okay, so the next question is the question: What is the um, collective lamp shift? So the lamp shift, not collective, just lamp shift, is the result of the interaction with the vacuum fluctuations. I hope you've heard this. In the case of the altered density of states that we get um, inside an ensemble, the value of the shift can change. And in particular, if we have a very high density of re um, radiators, it can be considerably altered. And what comes out is what we call the collective lamp shift. Okay? And in particular, um, well, I, I give the in particular in two slides. So this, of course, has been also done. And there was an, an ten, a 10 year ago or more than 10 years ago an experiment in the Adams group um, where they put um, a an, an, um, uh, an cell inside a, um, inside a very narrow uh, pair of plates and they changed the, the thickness of that so that they can really do that as a function of propagation length. And this is how the cell looks like. And this is what they got. Um, this is only the shift. Um, or this is what, what, what would be the collective lamp shift. And in principle, it's a great lev um, measurement because it's really vacuum. They send a very weak prop field through there, et cetera. The problem with this is that, um, um, that they later found that a lot of these oscillations that they have here actually are, are internal kind of um, cavity reflection. So they basically did that again. Um, this is this lower, um, this lower paper. Um, but in, the, in that new paper, they don't have such a nice picture anymore. So they, they, they do it a little, all a little bit more careful. So I don't have anything to, to compare here to. Um, so how can we calculate this? Oh, and this is actually what you find in Grosse Roche. This is a classical calculation for this. And, but here, um, um, let me get a little bit back to this, to this um, calculation that I introduced you before too. So um, the total collective shift, um, which is delta, um, has, and, and both the gamma and the delta, which is actually before I called it um, J and delta, um, uh, the J and gamma, <laughs> so now I call it delta and gamma, um, is actually um, just an integral over this Green's function. Please do note that these fields are these stressed fields that I mentioned before. And um, if you look a little bit closer, um, we have a part that is basically proportional to this, to this commutator, which is basically this commutator between A and A dagger and is therefore one and is therefore independent of the intensity. Um, we could also have a stimulated part, which is also part of that, which depends on the number of photons, which in, if we have super radiance is totally overwhelming. 
Um, but if we have basically no, a low light level, we see only the spontaneous part, and this is what we call the collective light shift. Um, this one, I don't give you any more of the calculation because it's rather complicated, even though it's easier than the, the whole thing that we did before. Um, this, this gamma and delta depend on, um, on all kind of pairs of atoms, i and j, and are nonlinear functions of the vacuum decay rate themselves. Um, the atomic um, state, the, 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 the tuning at which we probe it, and the number density. And what we find here, um, this was actually Han Shen's work, who is also sitting in the audience, um, and, and, and some of the stuff that I showed before as well. So we find, yeah, we actually do get quite some changes depending on the number density here, and that it also um, follows Kramer's chronic relation, not very surprisingly, and that it becomes very unsymmetric the more the denser we get. And we can also see that, and here I should say, sorry, the first that we calculate is, is, for, is, this, is for i equals j. And this one can also be plotted as a function of the density of atoms. Um, the second part is where we calculate the, the pairs where i is not equal j. And I will get back briefly to that afterwards. Um, so please do note that it falls off for distance very quickly, both of them, both the delta and the gamma. Um, but it's actually of a similar order of magnitude um, as, the, as, the, um, um, as the decay rate. So um, the problem is how to measure this. Um, and this one actually kind of stumped us for quite a while. And then we figured what it is the best. We take some kind of given volume. For example, um, here just for simplicity, it's fair. Um, and, and take, calculate the single atom susceptibilities from all these gamma ii and gamma ijs, that we, and delta ii and delta ijs, and calculate the single atom susceptibility chi i, then average the chi i over the whole volume, and, and define a gamma effective and a delta effective depending on this chi effective. And if we do this, then we find um, um, an effective, both an effective change in the spontaneous, uh, or the broadening in this case, and the, and the lamp shift that can, could actually be measured. And here you see the result, and you see actually a, a, a form that is reasonably similar to the form that I showed you before. To my knowledge, this is the first kind of general calculation of this kind of quantity. Okay, so now I need to um, sorry, I need to, to cut off a little bit because I've only in, um, three minutes left or so, um, even by my clock, which is slower than Anna Maria's. <laughs> um, so, um, let, me, let me just, um, this, this is interesting. Um, what, what I leave out is interesting, and Stefan, please forgive me. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to show this, um, where we show a little bit of how, how actually driven, um, driven super, super radiance um, scales with atom number. Um, they, they, just, just to give you a little teaser, um, we get the result that um, seems to contradict uh, the experimental result that was found by Brome, and we find also a way how to actually explain it better than what was done so far. But what we do here, and that's the last part, let's look at spin squeezing. So spin squeezing is also driven super radiance. So what we, what we need for that is a many-body quantum system, some interaction, an external drive, and what we don't need, but what we have to deal with is dissipation. There's, of course, a lot of, of spin squeezing with super radiance, which has been done, also, again, partially by people who are in the audience. Um, and it's even being used for, for actual quantum metrology. So here, remember, I showed you this, this, this collective shift. So turns out that for spin squeezing, we need this parameter. And we need this parameter. So this is the lamp shift. This one is this kind of change in broadening. And um, um, we need only the spontaneous one. And what we do, just in order to show you this, these two pictures that I have left, we average this quantity here over all possible i not equal j kind of gammas. 
um, and we call this gamma bar. Um, and it turns out that you actually do, even in the, in the realistic dipole-dipole um, um, case, so I, was, I should actually show it, sorry, Let's just go back briefly. Um, what you see here in these old papers, both by, 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 by Alejandro, Diego, and ours, is for a Dicke state. Um, in this case, um, we do it for a dipole-dipole, and we see indeed that one sees um, spin squeezing here. So here, this is for different optical depths. And here, this is for a strength of this gamma bar, which I just defined of 0 0.1. That seems relatively small, but we actually get reasonably strong spin squeezing in this case. Just as a, as a test, um, we set just by hand. We leave everything else the same. We just by hand set this gamma bar as small as it is equal to zero and all the spin squeezing vanishes. So this is, I think, um, a very interesting because it tells you where the spin squeezing actually comes from. And with that, I will finish. Um, that's my group, and these are in particular the people um, who, who did most of the work. So Victoria and Caleb are undergrads. Han Shen did all of these um, calculations with the, with the averaging over large systems, and Oriol and Stefan did, the, uh, did all the other calculations. And with that, I will finish. Perfect. So we are open for questions. Maybe I. Oh. Thanks for the great talk, Susanne. I just want to ask about the collective lamp shift. So at least the one I know from uh, from textbooks, like when you have the hydrogen atom interacts with the vacuum, then you have two s and two p levels. They split apart, right? Mm -hmm. Is it exactly the same thing you are computing, or something thank different? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So yes. And what I'm showing here is actually, I already kind of renormalized the, the vacuum lamp shift away. I should have said this. So the gamma bar that I show is already minus the vacuum lamp shift. Because the vacuum lamp shift, of course, I mean this in particular, the singularity that you get there is still there. Um, so what we have here is on top of this. So and on because, top of that, yes, it's on top of that. One. And of course, it's not S and P and whatever because we are dealing with two level atoms. Okay. That's so, also what I want so, to ask you which yeah. kind of atom are you having in mind or which yeah. atom was, done in, uh, so, was used in the experiment? Um, the rubidium. Okay. I think it was one of these typical kind of rubidium. Um, they, but but the, the change that you see is really a change due to the, to the density of the states. Um, or then, sorry, density of the atoms. It's a collective enhancement. Yes, of, of exactly. This. Exactly, yes. And thank you very much, because that's, of course, an important Thank important you, thank you. Point. Great. Okay, great. One more question. Yeah, thanks. Just a quick question regarding the molecule cooling. Like, how does it work with the directional scattering of photons? How should I think about yes. this? Like, that it's um, like not just going into arbitrary directions. Yes, but very, that's a very good question. That's what I actually, when I first kind of came up with this idea, what I was by far the most worried about. Um, and then I looked a little bit into, um, into this. There's a lot of old work where they say, OK, we have that and that strong super radiance and it becomes such and such directional, okay? And um, of course, if it's perfectly correct, um, directional, it doesn't work anymore. Um, because first of all, because this, of course, this, the directionality, you need that in order to, to kind of average out to the right direction, but it also has to do with entropy, right? So you don't have this entropy anymore if it really goes only in one direction. Turns out that for the kind of strengths of super radiance that we are looking here, um, it gets somewhat directional, but only mildly so, so, so you don't need to worry about this. But yeah, good, good question. I just had a quick question about the molecular cooling as well. Uh -huh. So you said uh, that you use a six photon transition to make sure things are closed, but you could build a closed thing with four photons, so I'm wondering why you yes, need yes, six yes. rather than um, But the point is, the point is, um, you, you are right. We did that just for simplicity in this case, right? Because with the force, you would have to really see which one do you use. That means you would have to add on one to one of these. But the, the thing is, with the six, you can take the same transitions and always have a delta J equals to one. That's why we use six. Great one. Last question. I just had also a quick question about the molecular cooling, just the experimental parameters that you need. I mean, you said you need the optical thickness on the vibrational transition, which one can uh, get at 10 to the 9. 
but how about the optical thickness on the EIT condition? Is this necessary or is it... No, no, it's, it actually should not be. And for example, in the case that we have, where we have, I mean, you know, an optical transition in a 10 to the 9 is not, is not dense. And we definitely don't want it dense. So you really want to get at the point where it's dense, optically dense uh, for, the, for the vibrational transition, but optically dilute for the, for the, for the other transition. Because there is, um, well, I have done this long enough. In a really optical dense EIT transition, there are so many problems. Don't even try. Okay. Oh, great. So let's, let's land.